going live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop and we're having a lot of fun. So we are testing out the new system here in the new shop and uh, if you can't tell I'm a little excited. Uh, so please let us know that we're actually live because uh, I've got a whole bunch of new things plugged in okay, here so I and I want to make to sure my... it's all working. What's that? How do I get the mouse back? Oh, slide it over to the side. Haha. Nice. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> so, new computers, new screens. Uh, we're having lots of fun. Um, so yeah, <laughs> if you can't tell, uh, it's all been about the the shop the last uh, oh, week. Oh, did here. you? What's that? Sorry, guys. You yeah. didn't do the thing to keep track of the questions. No, we're not going to do that right now. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So you don't, your work is much less today. All right. Um, so we're going to be getting the questions in a minute. We just have a, a few things coming up. Um, so yeah, on this one, we're not going to have, if you're watching this recorded, we're not going to have all of the questions um, time stamped uh, because I, we really need to have a whole other screen in order to do that right here. Um, and so we might in the, in the future, but we still haven't done that setup. This is, um, for events coming up, um, there are a couple coming up. Actually, uh, one, do you want to come sit over here? You, you can come you sit can over come here. In. Arthur, you well, want to say hi? Why don't you go get a, go get a chair? Volunteer to help with the camera. <laughs> our, our new shop is a little you more open to the hi. house. Um, so, yeah, kids are uh, around. <laughs> All right, okay. go play, bud. Go play now. Um, Boba. Um, events coming Boba? up. Yeah. Boba. No. You can make tea. <laughs> you got to be quiet, though, Arthur. <laughs> Welcome to the madhouse that is the rights. Um, events coming up uh, the 20th, not the 21st, the 14th of this month, so two weeks actually less than two weeks, uh, is going to be a meet here in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, so if you're going to be able to come down, I should be, I will be there for that. Um, then the next one I'm going to be at is actually out in uh, Vermont. It's a, it's a three-day event in uh, two days in Vermont, one day in Massachusetts. Um, so I'm going to be flying out for that one. Uh, then the national meet will be coming up in June, uh, and that is in uh, Madison, uh, Wisconsin, actually really close to me. Um, but there are like 13 different tool meets around the United States this month. Um, so if you want to see all of those, go to handtoolfinder.com, and I have a list of all of the, the meets on there. Um, so yeah, lots of things coming up. But I thought I'd give you a quick tour of the shop. Here, back up a second now. Um, let's switch over to this camera. So, say hi, babe. Oh, this is... Look here, you're in deep focus. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we've got... I can't wear my... Grubby jammies anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a thing with the uh, um, the, the patrons actually okay. building the clamp rack. This the is going to have to get. Well, you can move to the side. And slide the okay, um, y'all, we're this is a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got uh, tool storage over here. It looks very similar, except for I added um, a section here. So I'm, I expanded where all of my marking tools are at. Um, I've got, I added a new uh, rack down here for mallets and braces. And what was the brace rack is now just a shelf for drill bits. And uh, this, uh, I'm gonna be doing a video, I don't know if it'll be this Saturday, um, of a lot of the, the shop updates, um, all of the combination planes. Um, but then I have this, this is my old, old bench. Oh dear. What? what? It, oh. It's not up on the screen anymore. Hmm? Oh, here, just a second. Flip over to four. Yeah, back up now. Let's see what unplugged. I don't think anything unplugged. That's the thing. This one. Oh, because it probably went out to input PC. Hang on, guys. Um. Uh, bit a bit a bit of new systems. <laughs> new display settings. So it probably went back to, no, it's not there. So it says it's over there, but it's not over there. So let me try. Two. Well, two will be this. Ah, oh, there we are. No, that's, that's that. Oh. Well, you can, you can use it and just use it, which means you have to flip back and forth um, on this. So you have to go between this and then this. But it thinks that's over on the other screen. So we'll have to figure that out in order to close this. We'll just use that for right now. This is fine. Well, for the functioning, but actually closing, it'll be different. So, uh, so yeah. Welcome to the uh, the fun we have here. Let's go back to three. So, uh, a couple things we have coming up here in the shop. Um, this is the old bench um, 
that I, I started Wood by Wright on. And so that is now back in the shop. I had given it to my mother, um, but they moved as well, so they don't need it. Um, so this, if you come and do a class with me, which I'll be talking about those in a minute, uh, then that corner back there has all of the power tools. So you got the, the, the foot powered tools, the lathe, the, uh, the scroll saw, the mortising, um, the, the beam drill, the, uh, the post drill. And then here, hey, look, there's the, the TV. And we got electronics back over here. So this is what we're working on. And then the whole ceiling is all of the, uh, the wires and control and routing. And uh, hello. <laughs> and then there's a giggling melody. We included her in the shop. Not quite sure why, but uh, yeah, she's back. Because she's banned <laughs> from electronics. Yes. Uh, you can come sit down, Mel. Um, right, I'll try not to push any buttons that on the computer, not yours. Oh, that's fine. New things we got to learn. So that's what's coming up in the shop. Um, I am going to be, hopefully later this week, um, posting um, upcoming classes. So that's one of the big things that we want to do in having this shop space is this whole room is just shop. All the storage is now in other rooms. And so that means I can actually host classes in here. And one of the big things I'm doing with putting all of the wiring, electronic and camera setups in here is I want to be able to do a live class, but rather than just a zoom class where you can see this camera or this camera and I pan back and forth, I actually want to join the zoom with multiple cameras so that you on the zoom end can pick which view you want to see. Um, so that you can bounce between them and have an overhead shot and one that shows the whole room. And um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to having that set up. Um, so the first one will be, I want to say it was like May 15th. Oh, it is. Probably wrong with that. It's on the calendar. Um, but I'm going to do two short ones. And I'm going to be doing one a month for right now. Um, so the first two will be like three hour classes. Uh, where I'm going to be just testing out the system and seeing what's up. So if you are local, um, stay tuned for May that. May 18th. May 18th would be the first one. Um, but we will have the online class as well. So um, yeah, lots of fun coming up. So uh, that's what's happening in uh, Woodbury. It's been a while, um, so we had a lot to catch up on. Let's get into some questions. What do we got? Oh, dear Lord. Okay, hang on. I don't have my... Oh, yeah, you don't have the list now. <laughs> I'm Y'all, if I miss it, just throw it back in. But, uh yeah, usually we used to have my multi my multi screen set up on here, and so we're one screen short, so she doesn't have a place to put all of the, the questions. What is your first project you're going to work on in here besides setting up the shop? Well, yeah, I've got all of those. I'm, I have to finish up doing the timber framed ping pong table. Um, that has to be pretty quick because the camp is actually starting next month, so I've got to get that done. Um, I need to build a new sharpening station. So I actually want to build a whole little bench for the sharpening over there. Um, I'm working on a rack for, actually I finished that today, um, a rack for um, my wife. Um, <laughs> stretch her out on the rack. <laughs> um, no, for, hey, maybe I'll be taller. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, drying clothes. Um, oh, that rack. <laughs> so, yeah. Gotcha. Um, but as to furniture, I've got a long list of of things now. Your but, new bench. Yeah, um, <laughs> the bench is coming. Um, my dream bench, which I started, I, I bought the slabs for it almost two years ago now. Um, and so those dried for about a, a year and a half-ish out beside the house. Um, so I took those to the kiln to get them dried. Um, so probably in another three months or so, I'll get those back. Um, but I have an, a large Emirates vise over here, and I also have the... Uh, um, uh, uh, Klein tur twin turbo vise, um, and then I want to get two Hovarter leg vices, um, and so the the bench itself is going to be somewhere around a thousand pounds, and it will be a lot of fun. Um, but then I'll have that bench here, and then this bench will get turned around and go over there. So if you come take a class, you'll either work at this bench or that bench. Um, or possibly Sarah's bench, um, but the, my new big bench will be long, will be large enough that I'll work on one end and another student will work on the other end of it. Um, so right now we'll be able to have six students in here. I think we can get up to around eight, depending upon the project. Um, so it should be kind of fun. They, some people are finding the flashing lights distracting. Do you? Oh my! I forgot to turn those off. Flashing here. lights. I'll just turn them to blue. There we go. That's better. Stop flashing, people. <laughs> Anyways. Um, they want to know, do you miss your old shop? Um, you know, I have a lot of memories in that shop. It, it, it's, I started with by right in there. And uh, yeah, but no, the new one is much better. The new one is much better. 
I always think about that commercial from Ikea with the, the lamp. Oh. <laughs> You're crazy. The new one is much better. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this, is, this space is, is phenomenal. And I can actually wire it all up from the beginning. Um, having these lights from American Greenlight put in, um, having the rubber down. I had to get one more roll of rubber in order to cover the floor because uh, the shop is... Um, it's actually, the, the shop space isn't that much bigger. It's a little bit bigger. I think it's like, uh, um, what is happening up there? I don't know. What um, it's like 30 square feet bigger, um, which isn't a huge amount, but because all the storage is now out of the shop, the shop is actually for building space and it just, it feels so much bigger. Um, no, Melody, can you? go out that door and go tell them to, don't kick my camera. Uh, <laughs> tell them to sit still. <laughs> what do we got? Um, Gavin wants to know what is the best five iron? Uh, the best, well, no, Melody, go upstairs and tell them. I can broadcast. I don't really need to broadcast. <laughs> um, it's called a lot. Anyways. There are two irons in my book that are the top of the list. Um, if you've got the money and you want to have the best iron in the world, um, that is going to be from uh, Zinwu. Um, his irons are just, mm, they're, they're gorgeous. They're beautiful, they're fun, they last forever. Uh, and that's what I put in this plane, which is my out of focus plane. Um, this is my, my best possible smoother I can have, but this is the, the Zinwu iron and it is um, crazy thick. Um, but it lasts forever. I mean, just the tests I were doing on it, it was it, it, like six times longer than a normal um, Stanley. I mean, more than that. It's, it's just, it, it's amazing. So if you got the money, Zinwu is the one to go with. Um, if you want to get one that lasts just about as long, um, the new one with the, um, oh, come on, who is it? Not Red Rose Reproductions, not DFM. Not Tay Tools. Not Tay Tools. Um, it's the, the Magna Cut iron from. Is it Red Rose? No, it's not Red Rose Reproductions. Well, here, I've got one. Um, Lake Erie, there we are. Lake Erie Torx. This one. Um, the CPM Magna Cut iron is just. That is crazy, crazy good. Uh -huh. Uh, and the, the tests I've done, so if you really want to see, um, go take a, take a look at uh, um, the plain iron test that I've done. I did it in two different batches, as I, I did like 12 irons to begin with, and then I did up to about 24 irons. And then I had these two and I think two others that I added to it. Uh, and these two irons blow the rest out of the water. Uh, they are just, they, because before that I was saying uh, PMV11 was, was really, really where I, where, where I would go with. Um, these are hands, head and shoulders above the rest. Um, they blow PMV11 out of the water. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I would say go. What's next? So Zenwu or Lake Erie. Yep. Hopefully, Gavin, that answered your question. Um, is that Super Chat? It is, Dad Gamut. Hey, Dad Gamut. Good to says, see you. Hey, it's nice to see all these people again. We haven't seen you in a I know. While. Great to see you back in the shop. It'll never be this clean again. Just saying. <laughs> well, he no, did it, just clean. <laughs> it, no, it'll get it'll get much cleaner because um, I've got a lot more organization. I, I still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I have twelve boxes that I still have to uh, unpack and find homes for. Um, so it'll actually get cleaner than it is now. Um, and I'm I'm hoping because the next time I'm recording with Luke will be. Um, a week from tomorrow. So I've got a week more to get things put away and really clean it up. Uh, Melody, can you go close the sliding door over there? Oh, well, Dad Gamut wants to have a daughter joke. Uh-oh. Oh, Do you have a joke, Mel? Oh, goodness. Well, you better think about it. Think well, about I think it. I have one. Uh, it's an old one that I've used well, Come here closer because okay. I have the microphone over here. Uh, so what is it? Uh, what's a math teacher's favorite? Favorite dessert. Yell. What's a math teacher's favorite dessert? Pie. <laughs> it's the only, it's a one that I just thought 
What? <laughs> <laughs> Not good with jokes. It's a daughter joke for you. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> She has not become a full-grown joke teller. No, it has not become apparent yet. No, no. No, it is apparent that she's not. <laughs> um, sorry, I had a question in the chat, and then they all said, like, Erie in the chat, and yeah. I got to go find it. Oh, this missing the mouse back and forth. Um... We talked about that. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to find. Yeah, if you guys have a question, put it back in the chat and put it up the, the, the top. Well, what would actually be the bottom of the list right now? <laughs> okay, we don't have here. Out yet. Are plain irons interchangeable between different brands? In general, yes. Um, there, When you get to some of the older ones, like around the turn of the last century, uh, there were some that fought over plain iron size and they changed them by like a 16th or an eighth of an inch. Um, and so in that case, if you have the slightly smaller one, then you can't put the bigger one in there. Um, but in general now, um, if you go and buy a plain iron at 95% of the time, it's going to work. Um, but they all list how wide they are. So you can go check your plane. Um, it's the, the problem ones are uh, the old records they did that because they made them ever so slightly smaller than Stanley so that you couldn't put Stanley irons in theirs. Um, and if you put one of theirs in a Stanley iron, then it would be sloppy. Um, not that it's really a bad thing, but um, there was one other one that was stood out. I think it was Ohio. I think it was Ohio, Ohio Toolworks. Um, their old ones were slightly smaller as well. But in general, they, they all work, yeah. They're, they standardized very quickly. What's next? All right, let's see. You said your dimensions of the shop are roughly the same. Was it 10 by 11? Yeah, it's um, the, well, when I laid down the rubber, it actually laid out in here um, almost exactly, except for the, the shop was um, 18 inches wider. So, I've got 18 inch more this way. Um, no, it was more than that. I think it was 20 inches that way. And then the narrow section was two feet shorter, um, but the longer section was two feet longer. Um, so it, the footprint was, is very, very close to what I had before. Um, but before I had to store all of my things in the shop, and now I have a whole storage room and then um, I've got this space over in here with the electrical so I can put all of my uh, um, um, storage in there and um, so that the shop itself can actually be just the shop. Um, so it's the, the functioning tools, but it's not storing all of the finishes and the lumber storage um, and the nuts and bolts and the glues and the past projects and the cabling and the camera equipment and all that can get moved somewhere else. So. It's very happy. Um, Kenny and Janet Horn asks, what do you think the advantage of a single slash solid slab bench will be over a laminated top of the same size and weight? Uh, before you move on, it's oh, Kenny and, guess... and Jeanette. Aunt, did I say and Janet again? Yeah. Ah, sorry. I'm rusty. <laughs> For everyone else, it's Kenny and, it is. and Jeanette. It but is and I, I didn't know that until I met them. And I thought... For certain, her name is Jeanette, and uh, it's like, oh no, it's and and Jeanette, and so yeah. So hey, Kenny, hey, and Jeanette. Um, uh, yeah, the, the the monolith slab making the top out of one piece. There really isn't a big benefit to it. Um, you can laminate a top and have it just as strong, last just as long, and really not be a problem. Um, the, the only benefit to making it out of a solid piece is, is in your head. Um, and it's just one of those dream things that if I want the bench, I want to have the bench the way I want to have it. Does it have any benefit? Really, no. I can laminate up the pieces and I can get just as good a bench. Um, but making it out of a single piece just really makes me happy. Um, now, if, you, if you're not careful with it, and you don't fully dry it and make sure it is really, really dry and then fully acclimate it to the new space, um, you can run into problems with having a solid top 
bench top um, in that it will, as it dries, shrink and change in different ways. And so that's why I'm going to get it into the shop and I'm going to put it up on stickers and set it up in the corner. Um, and I'm going to leave it there probably for a couple months, two to three months. Um, and that's going to drive me bonkers because it's just going to be sitting there after it's been sitting outside and after it's been sitting at the kiln. Uh, but I want it to fully acclimate to the shop before I start doing things to it in here. And the nice thing is I'm in a basement that's all air conditioned and so the, the movement of the wood is, is not as big of a problem. And the movement of my arms might be. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there really isn't a big benefit. And if you're going to be in an outdoor shop um, or a non-air conditioned space, uh, actually there's some detriments to it because having a solid piece, it does move more than having the laminated piece. Uh, because the laminated piece, the grain is all going in slightly different directions, it kind of balances itself out. Whereas with a solid top, it's all going to want to bend in the same direction, so there's exaggerated movements. Um, and so there, there really isn't a benefit to it, um, other than it makes me happy. That's why I do a lot of things. That's why I married Sarah. I clearly was not paying attention to you. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I do things that makes me happy. Oh, so, I mean, it's okay. I do because you, you make me happy. <laughs> you make me happy. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, so, yeah. so the very important question is, does Sarah get her workbench back now? Um, <laughs> actually, I it, it's... it's um, oop, there, there, it's out of focus, but... Uh, yeah, the bench is right there. So yeah, if you come get take classes, you just put it together. It was in pieces not that yeah, just long about ago. An hour ago. <laughs> um, so if you come take classes, uh, you have the option to work at Sarah's bench, um, or you could work at uh, Melody's old bench over there, which is even shorter. And um, but uh, yeah, hopefully my bench, the one I'm currently working at, will go over here eventually, and the new bench would be there. So. That's that is the thing. cleanest my bench has been since we built it. Mm -hmm. Take a picture. It won't <laughs> stay that way. Hey, I got this bench to put things on now, so that's my prep table now. Good. <laughs> All right. We've, there's been a lot of questions, and now i got to catch them. Catch them. So. Got to catch them all. <laughs> the goat strikes. <laughs> um, Clemmergen. What? Clemmergness? I'm probably saying this totally wrong. Wants to know, are any tips for sharpening a saw with a really aggressive set? Um, well, I mean, you can always take the set out. Um, and the easiest way to do that is you take a hammer. Um, grab one here. Make sure you want to take two hammers. And uh, you put one of them in your vise face up. And lock it down, and then you drag the plate across, and just go tap, 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 as the plate goes through it, and you're bending them back. Um, it takes out a lot of the set, um, so you can do that, then sharpen it, and then set them to what you want. Um, but honestly, as a beginner, having a lot of set is actually a nice thing because having a lot of set means you can move the saw more. You can you can you can lead it different directions. You can easily back up and clean up your, your lines and get them back into stroke. Um, so having more set is more flexible and it's easier to learn on. But it also means you're removing a lot more material, which means more work, more effort, um, and it takes longer to cut things with bigger set. Um, plus they tend to scratch up the sides a bit more and you get a little less of a clean cut. Um, so more set is a problem. But as to actually sharpening it, um, there really isn't anything different between a saw that has a lot of set and a, set that, a saw that has a little bit of set. Um, I, I can't think of anything that would come out and sharpen it and make it much different. So, yeah, hope that helps. <laughs> What's next? Um, we have a super chip that Ooh, I didn't from. scroll down enough. It is from Cody O'Neill. Hey, Cody. Advice on optimizing cutting speed on a Barnes number no. seven scroll saw. It's complete, but round belt drive slips some, and the main drive wheel vibrates. Um, I have never actually used that particular saw, um, but one of the problems, if, if the belt is slipping, um, you always want to take the belt off when it's not in use. Um, otherwise, the belt just kind of stretches out, and then it just becomes that new size. So if you take it off 
of the 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 run, um, then it it will remain a uh, a smaller size. So then, just before you run it, you you break your. Um, as to the vibration, um, usually there isn't a vibration. They're not going quite fast enough for a vibration. It's more of just a, 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 a but uh, if, I'd have to remember. I don't remember that saw. Oh, uh, with the scroll saw, I'm thinking lathe. Um, with the scroll saw, you have the vibration. Of, um, yeah, scroll saws almost always have some vibration. Um, so I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to see that one particular. But feel free to send me some pictures, videos. Uh, my email is uh, jameswright at woodbywright.com. Um, so send me an email. I'll take a look at it. Um, I'm trying to think of anything particular with it. Um, unless the, the flywheel is out of balance, um, which could be, but it's pretty rare with cast iron because they were balanced from the time. But what you end up doing is you let it spin until it, it hangs. Um, and then the heaviest parts at the bottom, so you take a drill and you drill in just a little bit, take out some material and you spin it again and see if it hangs at that same spot and drill out a little more or you move it. Um, and so you're taking out material from the bottom of the wheel until you spin it and every time it ends up in a different location. But uh, usually the flywheel is not moving fast enough to provide a vibration. So, yeah. I don't know. Send me some, send me some uh, pictures or video and I'll take a look. What's next? I had one and it went bleep. Um, so I'm just moving on to the next one, guys. So sorry if I skipped it. If we skip yours, throw it in there again. It's fine. You talked about the rubber flooring in an earlier video, right? Like how much it, like just recently, didn't you? Um, I did, no, I haven't done a vi on the, I've mentioned it a couple times. Oh, okay. So it, cost and thickness of the rubber flooring. Um, I have three eighths flooring. Um, and <laughs> so all of my, mine is three eighths and I ordered one more roll from the same place. Um, but it's been what, five, four years now, something like that. Um, and this roll is ever so slightly thicker. I mean, not by much, so like a 64th of an inch. So I have a slight edge um, on there. So I'm, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do to kind of e even that out. I'm thinking about taking a plain pass to the edge and kind of beveling it a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's all 3 8 um, roll rubber. I buy it from um, rubberflooringinc.com. Um, and the one I just bought... Um, it was 28 feet by four foot, and it was $220, something like that. Um, so flooring-wise, it ends up being a little over $2 a square foot. -ish. Is that with shipping? No, no. Shipping is shipping is where they get you because it's it's freight. Um, so if you're ordering one roll, it's expensive. Um, but if you roll more rolls, the, the the price of shipping one is the same as the price of shipping four, basically, um, because they all have to be pallet loaded. Um, yeah, I think the shipping when I ordered three was almost the exact same price as ordering one. Um, so yeah, but uh, it, it, it comes out to around two to two fifty a, a square foot, and three eighths flooring. Three eighths flooring for general shop use is phenomenal. Um, if you are planning on rolling a car around on it, I would bump up to half inch. Um, I, I, I have a, a friend who has um, half inch rubber flooring, and he pulls his car in and out of the garage on it. Um, but for rolling, um, like, table saws and heavy equipment around, um, 3 8 is, is, is good enough. Um, I don't even, I don't carpet tape mine down. Um, I, in the last place, I had a couple small pieces that I carpet taped down because small pieces can slide around easily. But these things are 28 foot, 28 foot by 4 foot. It's like, I think it was like 400 pounds per roll. So this stuff doesn't move. It's, it's heavy duty, beefy stuff, even at just 3 8 So it's good stuff. It's the reason why when we loaded the truck, it was the last thing to get loaded into the moving truck and it was the first thing to come out. Before we put anything in the house, I brought the rubber down here and I rolled it out um, because I wanted rubber in the shop. It is um, between rubber and lighting, it's, yeah, well, other than, you know, I need the tools. Um, but it's one of those things that I will, I will have in every shop I have in the future because it's, it's phenomenal. Oh, I, we're not moving anytime soon to have another shop. Oh, I was just looking at houses, though, babe. <laughs> Good way to die. <laughs> What's next? Oh, dear Lord. Um, 
Well, there's always new people, so they want to know why your planes are blue. Um, the my planes are all painted. Um, here, focus on that. There you go. Yeah. Um, so my paint my planes are are painted blue. Um, if I fully restore a plane and I take off um, the original Japaning, I paint it blue uh, because blue makes me happy. Uh, this one. This one is actually Japaned blue, um, but getting the uh, oops, stop moving. Uh, the Japaning on this, I'm really not happy with. It just it did not come out well. You can see all the uh, it just doesn't it doesn't flow like regular one. And if you talk to anyone who's tried colored Japaning, it just never works out quite right. There there are a bunch of old recipes um, and people who claim that they got it right, um, but it's. It's, it's, yeah, a unicorn. At some point, I'm probably going to sandblast this off and, and paint it. Um, but for painting, I just use um, a self-etching primer, and then I put on uh, Rust-Oleum Metallic Blue and call it good. And uh, I like it. I do that. So you'll see I have some that are black. Those are the ones that I have cleaned up, but I haven't, like, fully stripped them down and restored them. Um, if they are really rusted and need a lot of work, and I strip them down, then I paint them blue. And, uh, so yeah, that's why I have some AKA plans. they were not bought brand new. No, no. <laughs> uh, my only plane on the wall that was brand new is the, uh, the Veritas custom plane. Uh, no, no, I, my, uh, my Stanley sweetheart low angle plane. That one was new as well. Yeah. Um, I just saw it. Do you have a particular film or movie that you appreciate for its historical furniture accuracy? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the Patriot. I knew that was going to be your answer. Um, and uh, the the Windsor chair uh, conundrum, um, but all of the furniture in it, um, and even like the uh, some of the the knockdown furniture in the the the, the camps, um, and uh, yeah, there's some interesting things in that, that that I found fun. Um, usually, the furniture isn't what gets me in the video; it's just the uh the use of the tools um, <laughs> and yeah everybody straps you, you can tell it's the same thing if you ever have someone who's diving in a video no video gets diving equipment right <laughs> it's, it's dumb. we won't talk about medical shows or <laughs> yeah um all yeah, my health care providers can understand yeah. furniture accuracy though I, i'm not i, I am not a, a historical furniture lover um, I, I don't do historical furniture, which I know kind of confuses a lot of people because I do a lot of hand tool woodworking, but I don't do historical hand tool woodworking. I do dumb hand tool woodworking because I enjoy it, um, not because I am duplicating a historical method. Um, and so most of the furniture I build is not anywhere near historical. I mean, I use dovetails because that's a great joint to use not because it was historically used for that particular use. And no, it was historically used for that particular use, but that's just because it's a good joint to use that. Um, and there's a lot of things like that that's just, it's kind of obvious to use that, whether it was historical or not, um, that's the way I do it. What's next? So Andrew wants to know where to get a replacement upgraded iron for an old five and a half Stanley with a two and a quarter inch blade. Um, for a five and a half, I'm trying to remember the five and a half, is it two and a quarter on this one? Yeah, mine's actually 2.28, so it's a little over two and a quarter, uh, which I think is the same as the five. Yeah, it's the same as the five. Um, that one's just a slight hair over. Um, if you actually need it smaller than that, I don't know who makes that. I mean, because, uh, um, oh, come on. What's his name? Um, Hawk. Hawk Iron. He has a couple weird sizes, uh, some of the smaller ones. Um, but I don't know why you wouldn't be able to use the, the standard ones, in which case then you can get them from... Um, 
a couple dozen different um, makers. Uh, but if you go, if you search on YouTube uh, for plain iron test, I have a list on there of, I think I'm up to 30 different replacement plain irons um, in different companies and ranked on there. And most of them sell all the sizes. Um, that's just pretty standard. But I don't know. I, I, the thing that's racking my brain right now is whether two and a quarter is the official size or if that's the smaller size that was only used on some of the really old ones. Uh, in which case then, Hawk, I know would have it. Um, he, the, Hawk has everything. Um, Veritas, well, Veritas now owns Hawk tools. Um, I think Lee Nielsen has them. Um, someone in the chat is probably screaming at me for something. I think Lake, Lake Erie does too, because I think Lake Erie was the one making a couple of odd sizes as well. But, uh, yeah, send me an email if I didn't help you out with that. I can um, look it up. But uh, yeah, go to my, my list of, um, of uh, replacement plane irons on there. You'll see several of the makers. And I actually list on there the sizes that I was using. Most of them are for the number fours, but a few of them were the, uh, the larger size. What's next? Is mixing your own milk paint worth it? I've used general finished milk paint and like the results. Um, eh, in my book, no. Um, mixing milk paint is annoying and it sometimes comes out well and sometimes it's not. And you get the pre-mixed stuff and it just works. Now, if you're in it for the enjoyment of the process and um, you, you want the full experience, then yeah, go ahead and mix it. Um, but then you're also probably using your own homemade hide glue and you're mixing your own shellac. Um, and it, it's, it's about the experience then. Um, you're going to get a, a, a product that may not be absolutely perfect, but because you put your time and effort into it, it means more. Um, but there really is no benefit in the actual function of mixing your own as opposed to buying pre-mixed. So, yeah, that's my two cents on it. Did I hear that there's milk in this, or am I hearing that wrong? Uh, well, originally it was a, a casein um, mixed um, glue, but now it's... Um, I don't, actually, I don't know. They might use a, a whey in some of them. Why would you use milk in glue and finish? That just sounds weird. It does sound weird, doesn't it? But that's why hide glue can be made out of any protein. That's why there's fish glue and bone glue and brain glue and hide glue, and they're all from different parts of the animal body, but they all make a, the same protein glue. But it's the same thing with milk paint, is it's actually a protein that bonds it together so you get a little bit more of a resilient surface. Um, even though in comparison to modern paints, it's not resilient at all. That's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to history. <laughs> What's next? Sorry. <laughs> uh, keeping it real, folks. Keeping it real. Um, Dave wants to know, what's your preferred method of rust removal? I've heard that vinegar is bad for plain slash reduces resale value. Do you know if it's true? <laughs> well, yeah. So talking about rust removal, here, focusing on this now. This thing here. So uh, I have one. Yeah, you can see it on this one. But uh, I had one box that got wet. And, of course, it was the box that had my seven, my eight, and several of my panel saws. And uh, so I've got to do some rust removal on this. Um, oh, this is still bugging me. So, yeah. Um, if it's something like this, Scotch-Brite and some oil or WD-40, um, that's, that's all I'm going to do to it. Um, if I need to go down farther, um, if it's a flat surface, I'm just going to be sanding um, or, or grinding it off or a wire wheel. Um, but if it's a big surface and it's inside the plane, um, the moment you t start talking about acid baths, you're going to get arguments. Um, and as long as you are careful with them, they are not a problem at all. And I know I just ruffled a few feathers there. No, you are not going to cause problems to the steel that are actually a functional problem as long as you don't leave it in there too long. You put it in there until the rust is eaten through and you take it off, you neutralize it, and it's perfectly fine. 
Um, you are not going to cause problem to it, and you are not going to hurt the resale value. And if you do it right, no one's going to even know that that was the method you used. Um, it is by far the cheapest, um, simplest method that anyone can do quickly and easily. And if you're just looking for something to get up and going, it works phenomenally well. Um, I've actually probably three quarters of my restoration were done with vinegar baths. It works very well, it's efficient, and it doesn't hurt the tool as long as you don't leave it in too long. Um, but if you do leave it in too long or you use a, a too high of a concentration, um, then yeah, you can do um, damage to the steel. Um, as, particularly with saw blades with a thinner steel on there, um, you can get them slightly more brittle over time, but you've got to be in there for a long bath to do that. Um, the, the next step up that costs more but doesn't have the downside to it are things like um, um, evaporust um, or uh, the metal doctor um, or uh, one of my favorites now is actually WD-40 specialist. Uh, they make a specialist rust remover bath that you buy the gallon jugs of it um, and it works really really well. Um, I can get that places where it's evaporust is harder for me to find. I've now found a couple places locally where I can find it. Um, some places you can buy them at the uh, um, auto parts stores. Uh, but the nice thing about that is it takes the rust off, does a really great job, does it efficiently, does it quickly, and doesn't have the downsides of the, um, of the vinegar baths. Um, and so it's, it's great, other than the fact is it, it's expensive. Um, then the next step up, if you really want to get into it, is making an electro, uh, electrolysis bath. Um, and there are pros and cons to that as well. Um, and so, yeah. Um, but... If you hear someone saying that, oh, don't put it in vinegar, it's going to hurt your resale value. If you do it right, it's not going to hurt the resale value at all. If you do it right, no one's going to even know, and it's not going to make any difference at all. Um, it's cheap, it's efficient, it works well, but you have to be careful with it. Um, so, yeah, hope that answered your questions. Though I know I ruffled a few feathers. <laughs> What's next? Um, do you use a moisture meter? I have several of them, um, and in general, I don't use a moisture meter um, because I, I know the, the places where I get my lumber. If I'm buying it from a local sawyer, yes, I will have a moisture meter, and I will also bring it into the shop and leave it in here longer to let it acclimate to the shop longer. Um, but if I'm buying it from a, a lumber dealer, uh, like the, the guy I go to the most, um, he's um, uh, Badger Hardwoods um, just across the, the state line into Wisconsin. Uh, really good stuff and very reputable and I know everything I'm getting from him is fully kiln drying um, and really good. I'll bring it into the shop. I'm going to let it sit for a week or so and I generally don't even test it. Um, but yes, I have a couple different moisture meters that I use for different applications. Um, if I'm working with a local sawyer or like I'm bringing my big slab back in for this, um, yeah, I'm going to be uh, testing that. Uh, most of the time, what I'm actually be testing is rather than testing the slab itself, I'm going to take a cutoff from it, and I'm going to dry that completely, and then let that acclimate. And I'll have some small cutoff piece that I know is from that particular piece, but that will change faster because it's smaller. And so I will test that piece, and I'll know what is its acclimated percentage. Because the actual percentage you get is a worthless number. Don't, don't ever worry about what number it gets to. The, the number it gets to is not important at all. Um, in some places, um, I, I'll get it down to 5%. And with some woods in some places, 15% is, is fully dried. And other places I've been to, it's been like 20, 25% is fully dried. Um, it all depends on the wood, the application, the location. So the number really doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that you know it is dried. And so when you cut off a small piece, you can test that and know that this wood and this small piece is dry and that wood is testing at 9%. And then I can take my meter over to the log and just make sure that the log, the, the, the slab matches that small cutoff piece. And as long as those two numbers match, it's dry. As long as it's within a, within a couple of percent. Um, it doesn't have to be dead on exact. Um, and so yeah, that's why I use moisture meter for. Um, so not not very often, but it depends on where I'm getting it from and what the, the back story is for that particular board. What's next? Um, Pete wants to know, you mentioned your Stanley Sweetheart low angle. How do you find it? About one year ago and haven't got around to setting it up. Anything you think I need to know? Your 
focus on the smell. Um, I love it, honestly. Um, you're going to hear a lot of naysayers that are, are kind of picky about it um, because it, it feels a little bit cheaper than the others. Like the, the lever cap on this is aluminum. And you're going to hear a lot of people say, you know, 50 years from now, you're going to find a lot of these broken. I would actually be rudely surprised. Uh, the aluminum is very ductile. It, you're not going to be breaking this. Um, and if you're cranking it down that you're putting enough force in it to bend it, uh, you're doing something else wrong. Um, there are a few other things on this that are cheaper, but it is a for an affordable plane. It is a plane that the average Joe can buy without spending a lot of money. And so it really works well. I, I enjoy mine. I use it quite regularly. You can see it's, it's not something I've been, I've, I've taken pristine, perfect care of it. It's a user, um, but it works really, really well. And for a low angle jack, it's great. And a crazy amount cheaper than buying an antique. No. Or, uh, did you order the handle that way or did you modify it? No, oop, bring them. Yeah, this is the, the, the uh, that, that's one of the things that I don't like is that the handle is, it's what's called the modern handle and I really don't like it. Um, and it's one of those things I keep thinking, oh, I should make a new one and actually make the traditional Stanley handle, which I, I love the feeling of that. Um, I don't like this. Can you order a different handle? Is that the No, handle? not for... Not for, not for this. That one. Um, for the, where is it? The Veritas Custom. This one, um, you can order the handle and the knob, and I think they have four different knobs you can pick, and three or four different handles you can pick, and you can pick the angle, and you can pick the the steel type, and you can modify all of these things to get exactly what you want. Now, to do that, it is expensive. You can buy three or four of these for the price of one of these, um, but. Uh, yeah, different planes for different uses. But yeah, I love it. Um, just understand it's not, it's not a high end. So the fit and finish on it, it's a bit lower. Um, it's a user plane. And take a little bit of time, set it up, and it will treat you well. Um, works great. Let's see. Matt wants to know, any idea how to make a shellac finish look like 100 years old with cracking, et cetera? <laughs> um, I've read a few things on that. I have never experimented with it. I've never tried it. Um, I don't really have any desire to do so. Um, and so it's something I don't really want to comment on because I don't have the background for it. Um, see if there's anything in particular I'm going to say. That. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I don't really want to say anything on it because I don't, I, don't, I don't know enough on it. It's one of those things of... I, I don't get into antique historical, trying to make things look old. That just doesn't intrigue me as much as those things, so it's not my, my wheelhouse, so sorry. But uh, yeah, ask Rex Kruger, because um, I know he's done that, um, so I think he has some, some good insight on that one as well. He does a lot more um, historical furniture. So yeah, he'd be a good one to go to. What's next? Well, Dad super chatted and said, how did they test moisture before electronic meters? Thanks, Dad. No, um, no, the easy way is uh, weighing it. Um, what you can do is you take your slab and you cut off a small piece and you weigh it to begin with and you record the number. You come back a month later and you record it again. And you come back the next month and you record it again. You come back the next month and you record it again. And then eventually you'll see that the weight suddenly stops going down and stays the same. And so it's, it's very heavy when it's wet and as it dries out, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, but then eventually the weight all stays the same. And you know um, that it has reached equilibrium. Um, uh, you, sorry, you don't cut off a piece of that particular method. You weigh, weigh the board um, and you know that it has gotten to um, equilibrium that way. Um, that, that's another way to know that your board has gotten equilibrium if you're using a moisture meter to compare one to the other if you cut the small piece off. Um, but yeah, you can actually weigh it for that. Um, the other thing is a lot of historical, they, they didn't. I mean, they would dry it for two years, let it sit out there, and then they'd bring it in and use it. Uh, you just know that if it's been sitting out there for so long, you bring it in and use it. Um, the rule of thumb is um, air drying one inch per year. So if your board is one inch thick, it's going to take a year of air drying to dry out. And most of the time, that is like the longest possible time. Most of the time with like a one inch board, you can air dry it in like nine months pretty easily. 
Um, and if it's any warmer or hotter, it's going to dry even faster than that. If it takes a full year, then you're in a pretty moist environment and it's going to take that time. Um, so you know if it's been sitting out for that long, it's probably dry. And a lot of historical furniture, um, the, the houses weren't air conditioned. Um, so there is expansion and contraction and everything. And so if the boards are a little bit wet when they're using it, then oh well, it's designed to do that. All of the joints are built in. So that expansion and contraction is not a problem. It, uh, it's a moving piece. And so historically, it's not something you would worry about too much um, because kiln drying wasn't as much of a thing. <clears throat> everything was air dried. And so you just knew that you left it alone for X amount of years and it's dry. Just so everybody knows, we are not getting to every question tonight. It is 8.52, just so you oh, know. Yeah. <laughs> just putting that out there. But Melody, do you have another daughter joke? No, I'm not good at jokes. Uh, you might have to give me a minute on that. Do you know what a goose sounds like flying backwards? Oh. Asuga, asuga. <laughs> <laughs> Mom thought that one on a drive back from church. <laughs> that one was for y'all. <laughs> so it happens when you have three children in the back seat and you're trying to entertain them. Um, gosh, I don't even know which question. Let me go back up. Then pick a random one. Just don't pick a bad one. Pick a good guess. <laughs> good question. <laughs> let's see thoughts on blacksmith or metal planing stops that are inset into benches that you mallet up and down i was playing the edge of a board and the board moved and i gouged my number five lee nielsen sad face here watch out watch out um i have i've got like six different bench stops in this bench but let me see if i can zoom in on this one Right here, watch out, babe. Do you need me to move? I got a bench stop right here. So I've got this one, and it's a bit loose in here, um, but I've got a wedge that I can drive in the back and put it at any particular height. Oh, sorry, wrong camera. There we go. This one here, um, the blacksmith wedge on that. And, uh, um, you know, I don't use plane stops that much. I prefer dog clamps, but... Um, was this question about hitting the plane stop? Oh, it's further. Um, um, I really haven't had any, had any problem with yeah. him anytime I do. He was planing the edge of the board, and the board moved, and he gouged his plane. Ooh, yeah. Um, it's one of those things that you just got to be careful with it. Um, like the one I use a lot now, if I need to, is this one. I think I got from Tay Tools. No, no, where did I get that one from? I don't know where I got this one. Yeah. No. I barely ever see you guys do. You, I barely ever see you use no. those kind So of I've got this one that actually goes in a dog hole, and uh, it's got these teeth on it, and it's metal, um, but this one holds its height really well, and I, I, I do like using this one. Um, but most of the time, I have the dog holes, and I actually launch lock between dogs um, I know a lot of people kind of poo-poo that it's a little bit slower but I enjoy it um, I like having the board lo solidly locked in place um, and even though I've got a bunch of plane stops and I've used them a lot I don't enjoy it as much um, but no I've never had a problem um, hitting it it's one of those things where I always have it lower than the wood and if I'm going towards it I am always a little bit just careful of it my dogs that I clamp things between are aluminum, so if I hit it with the iron, it's not a problem. I have shaved my dogs considerably shorter than they used to be. Um, I've hit them quite a bit, but when I have the steel ones, I'm just very careful with them, and I take my time, and I make sure that I don't hit it, so I've never had that problem. Um, i trying to think of anything in particular. Yeah, usually, it, as long as you have consistent force on there, it's not going to be a problem. Um, the, the problem is if it, if you're, you're bouncing, you get halfway through and you don't have enough force to go through and you stop, then you release the pressure and something moves and that's when you're going to run into issues. Um, so just be a little bit more deliberate and focused on what you do. Um, 
but uh, yeah, hope that helps. Probably doesn't. Sorry. <laughs> What's next? We got enough time for one or two more? Um, well, oh, 56. Yeah, let's we got see. Peter Super Chad said, I've had the opening few seconds of the Welcome Back Cotter theme song playing in my head since this live started. Welcome back, rights. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I know. I'd have to look that one up. Anyways, um, CJ wants to know, any plans to do more live stream build-alongs? Um, not right at the moment. Um, for right now, I don't know when the next live stream we're going to do. I'm not going to be doing them every week. I'm going to try and do a Q&A at least once a month and then have one other one in there. So maybe like every other week right now. Um, but I'm going to be, my, my, my main focus with live streaming is um, getting the classes up and going. Uh, so I'm going to be doing several build-alongs in the classes. So stay tuned for that. Uh, the first one will be, the, is it the 18th? Yes, of May. Uh, or 18th of May. I'm going to be doing two right off the bat. One I'm going to be doing in May that's on Dovetails. And then I'm going to do another one in June, or, yeah, June, next month, May, June, yes, <laughs> in June um, on Mortis and Tenants. Those are going to be slightly shorter classes. Where I'm just kind of experimenting with the format and making sure everything works. Um, and then I'm going to have a, uh, um, others that will come out, and I might end up doing some series classes. Um, but I really want to be focusing on having high-quality build-along classes, um, and I want to make them as affordable as possible. Um, and so it'll be set up. So on Zoom, rather than just having me and switching, you know, which camera am I looking at, I'm actually going to join Zoom with multiple views so that you on your end can pick which view you want to see. Um, so if I forget to switch or you want to see something from a different angle, you want to see it from above or see the whole room or you want to see what other people are doing in the class, um, you can actually um, do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to have that set up. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm really working on right now. Um, but yeah, eventually I'd like to do another um, build along um, live class. I just don't have a live um, session. I just don't have any, um, I don't have the bandwidth to do that right now. So stay tuned, but eventually. Did you talk about where you're going in the beginning of May? You usually do a like, hey, this is yeah. where I'm going to um, be. Yeah, yeah. So the, okay. next, the next meetings I have coming up, I have one, um, the, the one here in Rockford, it's in two weeks on the 14th, uh, Rockford, Illinois. And then I'm going to be in Vermont, and Massachusetts um, May 10th, 11th, and 12th, I think it is. Um, but if you want to see all of the upcoming videos, go to handtoolfinder.com. Not videos. Um, all the upcoming um, events. woodworking events. Um, there's, there's like a dozen or so around the U.S. in this month. So there's a lot going on this month. Um, but go to handtoolfinder.com. Um, or if you're on my email list, I put, send out an email. I try and do once a week with all the upcoming events. Um, so if you want to stay up to tune on that, oh, that's on there. What else we got? That's 859. 859. Sarah still has to go to work in the morning. Yes. We're, we're fading over here. So yeah, let's wrap it up. Um, so I'm, my goal is to do a live once a month, um, the Q&A, and then um, work in another one. and do, So we end up doing them every other week. Um, but uh, I don't know right now, so I'm still trying to get the shop up and going. So I'm just happy to finally have a class, uh, a live. So thank you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I'll do it. So until next time, have a wonderful day. Now we have to find the, uh, the button to actually oh, turn dear these Lord. off. Oh, dear Lord. Because we, we uh, yeah, we, we don't have... <laughs> ah, it is back up. I can do it. Okay. So go to the fun of new setups. All right, that, and then we can come over here and